amen. I'm, I'm going to be ministering tonight. First and foremost, I want to thank Pastor for the opportunity uh, to preach. Um, in Pastor's words, it was getting, keeping, keeping the fire hot um, so that, you know, I was thinking to myself, I said I wasn't going to say it, but I was thinking to myself, by the time, boy, by the time Pastor says, all right, it's time for you to go, I will be fighting me at the door. Like, no, I'm staying, I'm staying, I'm staying. It's too nice in here. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times you don't appreciate um, something until it's either you that has to do it or you need it or something. And uh, many times we, we, we don't appreciate enough what it takes in, in preaching and hearing the word of God and the good food you get. Uh, many young people don't appreciate it until they have to move out and realize, oh, so it, it just doesn't end up in the microwave. Like someone has to cook it. So that was many years ago for me. Yeah, all right. just, just bear with me as I set myself up. All right, so if you can uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Once you're there, we'll, we'll begin. That's the first person who's there. Amen. I'm, I'm here tonight to proclaim to you that with God on our side, we're going to do this. We're going to get through, not just this season, but we're going to get through all the way to the end, and we're going to make it, church. You in your life, in your personal life, you're going to make it. God's going to be with you, and God's going to see you through. And I'm here to encourage each and every single person here tonight that there is a line, and we're going to cross it with the help of Jesus. Amen. There's a, there's a man, a young man, well, he's not young anymore, but at the time of this article being written, a young man whose surname was Aquari, born around 1938, was competing in the Mexico City Olympics in 1968. And he's a long distance runner, normally runs the 5,000 meters, the 10,000. I know most of us, we normally even, at most we run for the bus, but he's a long distance runner running 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 meter, and also the marathon. And he's in Mexico City, in Mexico, at the Olympics there, and he's at the marathon. Now, if you've ever seen the marathon, or at least how it starts, it's just a huge, you know, tens of tens of people, dozens of people, all starting. There is no particular lineup. This person's in first, this person's in second. It's whoever gets to the line first, and when they say go, you all start running. So a quarry has found himself somewhere in the middle of this marathon. Everyone's excited, everyone's well and pumped to go. The gun goes off and everyone starts running. Okay. So he's been training for a long time. He's actually a professional athlete. He's not, um, you know, it's not his first time. He's done this many times before. He's actually um, a world champion. And he finds himself somewhere in the middle of this um, group of runners, athletes who are all running this marathon. And as they're running, you begin to, you get the really eager people who just sprint up to the front and try to sprint the whole way. And by the time they turn around the corner, they're on the floor gasping for air. Well, he's an athlete, he's a professional athlete. So he knows all about pacing himself. And a quarry in the midst of all these other people is running along. So they've been running for a little while now. They've gone about 150 meters into the race. By 50 meters, I was given up already. They're 150 meters into the race and now there begins to be begin to have quite a few splits going on. So there is the you know the really strong core up in the front. Then there's you know people in the second grouping, and then there's the third, and then there's the fourth, and then there's the people who are doing it for charity at the back. And so a quarry is there, of course, in the in the front in the front section in the front group, and he's running, and they're all now starting to get into one line. Slowly by slowly, they're all getting into a single line just in that front group. 
And as they're all sort of jostling for position, they're kind of, you know, pushing each other a little bit, a little tug of here, a little push there. Something unfortunate happens to Aquari because out of nowhere, he finds himself going at very, at top speed, about 150 meters into the race, he finds himself falling forwards. Someone, you know, a limb somewhere, someone has either pushed a bit too hard or he's tripped over someone's leg and he's falling head first into the ground at the Olympics in the, mar in the marathon. Thankfully, he doesn't hit the ground with his head first. In fact, it was his shoulder that hit the side of the pavement first and slash, there goes his shoulder. It's just a huge gash. There's blood, there's ble he's bleeding. And then comes next his knees. Knees lands onto the, onto the floor, the concrete. And you can imagine, he's, imagine you running at full speed, not a child, but an adult, you know, run, you running at full speed and you falling over the amount of damage is going to do to your body. So Quarry here, he's fallen down. His shoulder is bashed up against the pavement. His knee has a huge gash in it from just scraping along the ground. And then to make matters worse, the joint in his knee becomes dislocated. He's traveled a long way to be in this marathon. He's trained for many years. And in a very simple few seconds, everything he's ever done in his life, got to this point in his life, is just flashed before him. All his hopes, the prize money, the changes he'll be able to make in his family back home, is just gone. But Aquari isn't an, any, like any other person. Because straight away, once the huge melee of runners have all kind of dispersed, they've all kind of gone down the road now, they're much further on, and he's still on the floors trying to get himself up. The medics come, um, begin to attend to him. They're like, okay, all right, mate, listen. Uh, obviously, it was Spanish, so, amigo, como estas? Uh, bien, gracias. Tu en casa y su casa. You know, all of that. And they're telling him, all right, mate, just come over to the side. Let's, let's put the bandage on. Let's Let's get you to the hospital because this looks serious. Your knee should not be facing that way. He gets up. They're bandaging him up. They're getting him ready to put him into an ambulance, get, get him to the hospital. And he says, no, I, I want to still run. They're like, look, you can't run, man. This, you were already getting a cramp. And a lot, of play, a lot of runners already got a cramp. There's no way you're going to continue running this race with the amount of the distance that's left. And so Aquari begins to shrug them off. No, I do want to run. I want to run. I want to run. And so he begins to, to hobble away. He's walking away. Now, if you ever watch the video, you can tell how far behind he is by the police motorcycles who are right behind him because they can't be in between the athletes. They have to be either right at the very end, behind the last person, or right in front of the first person. They can't be in the middle, otherwise they're gonna crash into the athletes. So you can see the line of police and their motorcycles, flashing lights, just kind of pushing with their legs, left side, left to right, left to right, behind the quarry, as he's just there hobbling along. And then from time to time, he'll begin to jog a little bit and then go back to hobbling, he'll stop, he'll be holding his knee, he'll be holding his shoulder, he's in pain. This goes on for a bit of time, to the point of, it's almost about an hour later, and a gentleman at the very front pack of the queue who was running by the name of Wade or so, enters into the stadium, the Olympic Stadium in Mexico City. He's doing his lap and he finishes the race. And that was all done. He came first place. Then the second person comes a few seconds after him, then the third, the fourth, and then people and you know, within a space of about 10 minutes, the whole race is done, apart from a quarry who is still all the way back. And people are telling him, the stewards, everyone, listen, look, the race is over. Come on, come on, just get on the motorcycle, get in the ambulance, let's take you to the hospital. And he says, no, and he kept running. One hour later, he's walking through the tunnel. Now, to show how, how far behind it was, the stadium seated 78,000 people. By the time a quarry gets to the stadium, there's only a few thousand people left. 
And the reason why the few thousand people stayed was because they heard there was still one more runner who wouldn't give up despite his injuries. You know, words start going around. And he enters into the stadium. He sees that there's still a few thousand people. In fact, the sun has set. It's gone from daytime even into um, the sun setting. And he sees a crowd of people and he begins to jog again, running, running. Everyone begins to get to their feet. They begin clapping and applauding him like, wow. By this point, all the bandages are just flying around in the air, just flapping in the air. And a quarry hobbles over to the end. He crosses the finish line about an hour, just over an hour later after the person who came first. And straight away, the journalists around him, listen, all right, why do you do amigo? Why you, why you do this? Why, why, why? And he simply said to them, they said, why did you never stop? And he said, my country, Tanzania, never sent me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. 1968, his story is still being celebrated all around the world. I want to share with you in our text, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the rates that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are asking for your grace tonight, your mercy. God, I'm asking you, Lord, that tonight that you would imprint into the hearts of your people, O God, that you are with them, O God, that you're going to see them to the end, O God, that they should not give up, O God, that even against all odds, God, that they will carry on, God, even carry on hurt, Lord, but God, that you are with them and you're going to see them to the end, Lord. Let that be your word tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Finishing well. There's a quote I want to mention. Many people start, but not as many finish. The reality is that many have started the race of salvation, but many have not finished it. One of the things that blew my mind it happened a few weeks ago when we were doing the testimony service, the New Year's Eve testimony service. And something Sarah said. She was giving a testimony of how God's been faithful in her life. And then the words she said at the end, you know, out of everyone I got saved with, out of everyone that was, I, I, that I was around, that was around me when I first got saved. Now, the moment she said that, straight away, I was there. Some of you were there, as many of you were there as well. When we saw that group of people that had come into church, all different shapes and sizes, no, um, all different personalities and characters, all different, you know, ways and of how they do things and some really bubbly, some, it's all right, man. no, I'm cool. Just all different, the different types of people. There was a good number, uh, seven to eight or 10 people, 10 of them that are all coming to church, uh, all around the same time, Church is brimming with these young people just don't know what to do with themselves. They're just really hyper. They don't want to do things. They want to do things for God. They're so hyper. They don't want to get on the streets. And they don't want to hurry. And they want to do things. And they just, and Sarah was saved in this group of people. And she says the word out of all of them, I am the only one left. Many people start, but not as many finish. I think about uh, while we're in the topic of sports, the Ethiopian runner, Hagos Gebrewet, He's running the 5,000 meters. So this is in the Olympic Stadium. And he's running, running, running. He's getting to the finish line. And you know how the runners are there. They're about to uh, press the stopwatch. He hears the bell go, ding a 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 ding He's like, oh, yes, there it is. They're ringing the bell. I'm about to cross the line. He crosses the line. Stop. Ah, starts putting his hands in the air, fist celebrating. He's celebrating. He's so excited. And all he can see is some people like, and he's like, yeah, come on. And he's like, he turns around and he sees the person who was in second place still running up to him. He's like, he's crossed the finish. Why is he still, still running? Why is he still running? He looks behind him even further. Third place is now catching up. And he just realizes 
what everyone is saying. They're not saying, woohoo. They're saying, move, keep running, keep running. And so he begins to start running again. And I couldn't help but think to myself, he heard the bell and thought that that was the last lap. But if only he had read the instructions or the manual of the track and field, that when the bell goes, it means you're on the last lap now. It means you've got one more lap to go. But this gentleman here, this athlete, Hagos, just stops because he didn't understand what the ringing of the bell meant. How many know it is important for us as Christians that when we're running this race of life, this race of salvation, that we understand what the manual, the book of life, has to say? Because there are so many times in life that things that we hear, things that our ears picks up, that will cause us to stop running, that would cause us to lose focus, to lose attention, to take our eyes off the price, to take off our eyes off the real finish line, if only we would immerse ourselves in the word of God, understand what the Bible says, how many know when you start to hear things, when you start to hear things from people, when you start to hear things from your situation, it's not going to stop you from running because you know what the word of God says. You know that Jesus says that he's the author and he's the finisher. It doesn't matter what you hear people who shouldn't have said what they said. It doesn't matter what your situation, which you shouldn't be in, says to you. You know what the word of God says. If only our runner here knew the rules of the track and field, he would never have stopped running. Too many people are on their last lap before God is about to break through in their lives, before God is about to open the windows of heaven, before God is about to reveal to them the secrets of their life, the secrets of their death, before destiny is about to be opened before them. Too many people stop running on their last lap. The Bible is the manual of life, and we must place ourselves in the work we need to... It's not just about just, oh, yeah, I need to read my Bible. No, we need to love the word of God. My RE teacher, religious education teacher said, but I've, I've, I've read the whole Bible and it didn't do anything for me. Because they're not saved. They're just reading it because they need to tick off the curriculum that they, they study this and they're teaching about Lent now. I want to tell you something. You have to love the word of God because when you're saved, when you're right with God, it's more than just something you need to do to tick off your day. The noise that he hears stops him from running when it should have encouraged him to keep on running and not stopping. Now, in our text, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. How do we do what Jesus did? who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How do we keep hold of the prize? How do us as Christians continue to serve God year in, year after year? How do we hold on or keep hold or sight of the prize? We need to do what Jesus did. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. In other words, as they were beating him, as they were mocking him, as they were riling and just kicking him about and tearing out his beard, the Bible says that the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So now the question is, what was the joy that was set before Jesus that would make him endure all that he went through? See, our text says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Some people would think, oh, okay, so it was the opportunity for him to be at the right hand of the throne of God. That was what he was looking at. I want to tell you something, that's not right. Because the clue or the answer is in him being the author and finisher of our faith, of your faith. In other words, your salvation, the story of your life has been written by the Father in heaven, has been written by Jesus Christ. And he is the author and finisher of our faith. And so basically the answer is, 
that the very fact that Jesus can see how you end, the very fact that Jesus can see where your life will end up, is what caused him to endure being on the cross. He saw broken people. He saw people who were abused. He saw people who were rejected. And he not only just saw them, but he saw what they could become as he was using his godly insight to look into the future. He could see broken and hurting people wearing a white robe in the righteousness of God, living their lives in dominion, no longer bound by sin, no longer left in the mires of sin, walking in God's righteousness. And he says, I can endure. I can keep going through what I'm going through because one day Idris can get saved. His life can be turned around and he can be forgiven the things he's done in his life that he wouldn't have to face the full consequences of it because I can see him one day getting saved and being forgiven and turning around, turning around his life being turned around. I can endure the same way it goes for you and I tonight, church, that because Jesus can see the difference it can make in your life. The Bible says he endured on the cross. So as we're here, Jesus is back there many, many, many thousand years ago. And he's there and he sees us and he sees the joy in our lives. And he sees the dominion in our lives. And he sees that, you know what? Generations that come after us are going to be walking in dominion. That there are going to be people whose lives will be changed. The Bible says he endured. He was being beaten while he was being bruised, while he was being punched, while he was being kicked. All he could see was you. And all he could see was that you were saved, you were forgiven, and you were walking in your right mind. The Bible says because he could see all of that, he endured the cross so Jesus went through everything that he went through just because he could see you making it because he could see you getting saved because he could see the weight of sin coming off of your shoulder the Bible says Jesus endured the cross the question is what can you see before you that would cause you to not give in to not give up there are people around you and those who will come after you that depend on you reaching the finishing line, that depend on you making it to the very end, not just the finishing line. Our lives cannot just be full of, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to, the story of my life is the rat race or my career or, or I've, you know, I've got 2.4 children, so I'm, you know, just raising them and making them go to um, saxophone class. That cannot be the story of our lives. It's got to be so much more than that. Because for Jesus, he saw others. And that's what made him endure. I want to tell you something. We are here representing a vast multitude of people. The access we have before the Father, to cry out to the Father, for the family and friends that are around us, I want to tell you something. Jesus endured because of others. We can endure because we only need God to show us why he saved us. It was to get us saved, to get us in our right minds, but then it was for others. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. When we trust Jesus to allow him to finish the work, we won't just cross that finishing line but we will finish well. Many years ago, um, it was actually my first time um, in church, we did something called a talent night. Now, this talent night was very different. If you were there, you remember it. Please don't tell anyone the story. Somebody was going around with a hat with names inside the, inside, uh, the hat. Now, the talent night was very, this talent was very different because when you picked a name out of the hat, that one of the names in the hats was actually of somebody else who ministers in, in church, in concerts. And the whole point of the talent night was that you were, when you picked that name out, you were to mimic or sing like how they sang or sing their song. And so, you know, um, it came, I, was, I was hoping for one name. I picked it out. <sighs> oh, my God. I can't, I can't, I can't. Can't do this. I was like, you already picked it. You can't put it back in. You need to do it. And so, you know, if you remember the story, or if you remember the what happened, then 
right. Um, and so the song that I had to sing, well, yeah, exactly. I had to sing a song. I was hoping it was going to be a rap or a poem or something. But I had to sing a song. And I've got a note here that says, under no circumstances shall you sing this out loud. You are not past, sorry. Yeah, so I can't sing it. But the name of the song, I'm going to need your help, is Sometimes We All Need Somebody to... Thank you. Right. And I won't tell you how that night went, but it, yeah, it, it, was, it was a long time again before I went behind the mic. And it's true that from time to time, we all need somebody to lean on. Everybody has a wall, a wall of defense. Some people, every single one of us has a wall. Some, you know, we wouldn't just allow anybody into our lives, right? Um, just, just step into our lives and just tell us about anything or whatever. Everybody has some form of wall. Some people don't just have a wall. They have a very high wall. You have got to invest in them before they even let you, you know, inside or share anything with you. It's going it's to, they've got a high wall and it's, it will take a while. You've got to be patient. Some people don't only have a very high wall but they also have reinforced steel plastered along the wall with rotating spike cogs and arrows that explode upon entry if you get close. And I know that because I met one of them uh, a couple of months ago. I was working at Test and Trace and I was, you know, taking mobile units and I was taking um, a team, uh, the team that was in the car, just me and two other people. Um, to our site where we are going to set up. And um, I was talking with a, this guy, his name's Joe. I'm like, yeah, Joe, did it, X, Y, Z. And I realized, oh, there's a lady behind who is not really participating in our conversation or is just completely. So, you know, trying to be friendly and nice. I said, so, Tanya, where are you from? And the moment I said that, I just noticed my friend went. I was like, oh, come on, it's not that bad. You know, I mean, like, I've. I've dealt with certain people. I've worked with certain people, man. Come on. <laughs> okay. I've got another note saying you shall not do the accent either. Okay. So, uh, Tanya takes off out of her earbuds out, and she basically says, why are you asking me where I'm from? Why are you trying to uh, bring division? So, you know, we've still got about 20 minutes in the car journey. This is like, oh, so I'm like, oh, come on, I can, I can get over this. It's nothing. You know, I'm going to show this guy next to me that, yeah, I know how to work with people. And so I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm just trying to start conversations. He goes, well, I think very low of people who start conversations like that. Okay. I mean, thankfully, I was driving, so I, I can only look forward. <clears throat> and... Anything I would say, she was like, there's no point in you asking that. Now look, silence. You're not saying anything. Well, you know, I'm just trying to be friendly. Well, no need to be friendly. What's the point? Here's headphones back in. And I got out of the car, my friend was bossing up. He was laughing his head off. And I'm like, there is some people, as close as you get to them, they've got spike cogs and arrows that explode upon entry. And people are like that because that they've been hurt, either wounded deeply, and so they shy away from forming any type of relationships. They don't want to lean on anybody else. They want nobody to lean on them either. Proverbs 18.24 says, The man of too many friends chosen indiscriminately will be broken in pieces and come to ruin, but there is a true loving friend who is reliable and sticks closer than a brother from the Amplified Version. And I couldn't help but think, if we're going to make it in this race, there's going to be times that we all need somebody to lean on. Very early on in my salvation, I'm, I remember very clearly I was praying and I was asking God certain things and, and God spoke to me. One of the very few times God spoke to me. And he said, you are only here because others are praying for you. And I realized at that moment, 
you know what? There's times in my walk with God, I'm holding on to Jesus and then I've let go. But because other people have been praying for me, they've basically put a harness onto Jesus that even in the time of my craziness or foolishness and I let go, I was still hanging on to Jesus. And we all need somebody to lean on. Job 16, 20 to 21 says, my intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. There are times in our walk with God that we're all going to need each other. We're going to need one another to be able to get to the finishing line. I, I want to show a video, the first of two videos, and um, we're going to quickly watch that. Johnny has to win and to be sure of taking the title. And right now, he seems to have lost control of his legs. And this is worrying. Oh, and he's starting to slow. And there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. And Johnny is running out of time and is losing. He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Oh, goodness me. This is a horrible sight. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course. And Alistair's stopped to help him along. And Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home. Dramatic scenes in Cozumel as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. Oh my God, I cannot believe what we are seeing here, Matt. Is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. Unbelievable scenes. Unbelievable scenes in Cosimo. The Brownlee brothers arm in arm, but it's not by way of celebration. Henry Schumann's celebrating. He's going to win this race in Cosimo out of nowhere. But we have to be concerned about the health of Jonathan Brownlee. And they're not even on the final stretch yet. Schumann wins in Cozumel. The brothers are coming home arm in arm to finish in second and third. But Johnny can hardly stand. And Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me. What an incredible conclusion here. In time to time, we all need somebody to lean on. We are not an island to ourselves. And we need each other if we're going to make this. And we're going to get to the finish line. Even the best people need someone else to help them at times. And you know, there's times when... We need other people, and there are times as well, the only person that can help us is the Father in heaven. So the question is, how do you know when it's only God that can help us in a situation? In my experience, the way I've done it, is I've exhausted all other options. For whatever reason, this time, the per this person who helped me before wasn't able to help this time. They're in their situation. Or I've exhausted all different avenues, and then I've realized, and then sometimes we realize, God, you're the only one who can help me. But so many people disqualify themselves from God's help because they think they're not worthy. 
straight away I think about a young man named Samson, who's probably one of the most discredited men in the Bible, one of the men in the word of God that people perhaps maybe look down on so much because he blew every chance he got. He was meant to have been set apart. He blew that all up. But at the end of it all, one thing you have to give um, Samson props for is that at the end of his life, he knew where to go. When he had upset his parents so much, they had finished with him. They said, look, go marry whatever you want. When everyone around him says, I, listen, you are, I can't trust you. At the end of his life, he knew where to go. Then Samson called to the Lord saying, oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Judges 16, 28 to 30. Just this once, oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported a temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right hand and on the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he killed in his life. Here is someone who understood their position before God, that even though they had messed everything up, they knew that he knew, he knew, he knew. You know, if there's one person who I could still, I could still run to, maybe because I've messed up everybody else or no one else would give me another chance, I know I can go to the father. The prodigal son knew he could go back to his father's house. He could have said, my brother has many servants. He could have said, my uncle, my auntie, my cousin. He said, that my father, and he went back to his father's house. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, as we get the next video ready, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Because church, there are some times in your walk with God that only God can help you, that only the Father in heaven can help you. And we're going to watch this last video here tonight. sometimes it's only the father in heaven that can help us get to the finish line i want to ask if every head could be bowed and every eye closed tonight